than two months away, and Americans abroad are working hard to get out the vote. It could not be more important for you to vote this year. There are hundreds of tight races across the states right now. And of course, we are working so hard to flip the Senate and win back the White House. Your votes can make that difference. Um, today, we're going to hear from Malcolm Nance. He's here courtesy of Angela Fobbs and the Democrats Abroad Global Black Caucus. Angela is our Global Black Caucus chair and also the comms lead for Democrats Abroad Germany. She is based um, near Frankfurt, Germany, and is a Florida voter, which is a, a really important state that we are sure we're going to, to win. We are working very hard with the Florida party. So Angela, are you ready to take it away? I am. Um, welcome, Malcolm. Thank you so much. Uh, Malcolm Nance is a counter-terrorist and intelligence consultant for the US government special operations, Homeland Security, and intelligence agencies. He's also a counterterrorism analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. He's the author of several books, including the trilogy, The Plot to Hack America, How Putin's Cyber Spies and WikiLeaks Tried to Steal the 2016 Election, and The Plot to Destroy Democracy, How Putin and His Spies Are Undermining America and Dismantling the West, and his latest book, The Plot to Betray America, and how Team Trump embraced our enemies, compromised our security, and how we can fix it. Uh, welcome, Malcolm. Thank you for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Angela. It's nice to see you again. Yes, it is very nice to see you. Although I see you all the time on TV <laughs> and on YouTube. You just don't see me, <laughs> that's all. <laughs> I will um, never forget our Ethiopian dinner in, in Frankfurt, so. Yes, me either. Um, it was really great to meet you. Um, I want to start off with asking you about uh, Trump's latest statements about the military. Um, as a former military person uh, with a generations long history of family being in the military, um, how, do you, how do you feel and how do you think this makes our troops feel? Well, if, if any of you still get MSNBC overseas and you watch Joy Reid's uh, readout last Friday, or even if you hadn't, you probably heard me <laughs> shouting on that program about just exactly how I felt about the losers and suckers comment that uh, Donald Trump made uh, to that was reported in this uh, article by Jeffrey Goldberg of The Atlantic. Um, and for those of you who don't know me, my family goes all as African Americans goes all the way back to the Civil War when my great great grandfather and great great grand uncle ran away from their plantation, joined a group called the First, U uh, First Alabama Volunteers, which became the Union Army's 111th US Colored Troops. And they fought in the Tennessee River Valley. Uh, my great great uncle would then go off and become a member of uh, the 9th Cavalry Lima Troop of the Buffalo Soldiers in the Indian War, where he would die and be buried at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Um, we have members from World War I. Uh, my grandfather, granduncle, fought in World War I and, and served in France. Uh, World War II, Korea, Vietnam. My niece is right now still in the US Navy and was in combat off of Yemen two years ago. So. Needless to say, we're a really military family. Uh, did I mention all five of my brothers were also in the Navy? So my poor ma had six of us in the military at one time. So I took those comments very, very personally. And so should anyone. It's not just those who are in the military or serve. If you have any concern, any caring or feeling about how America got, well, to where it was in 2016. I don't want to say to where it is today, right? Because it was doing pretty good up till 2016. But we've had 244 years of unbroken unity of the nation. And that was guaranteed by the armed forces of the United States. Apparently, that stopped with Donald Trump where the honor, the courage and commitment of young men and women who kept the country safe. And let me tell you, I'm not one of those guys who says the military is great all the time. We're not all heroes, right? We're just doing a job. And one of the jobs that I did in counterterrorism 
and I lived overseas virtually everywhere, uh, was I just don't like American citizens being hurt when they don't, don't, you know, unnecessarily, right? So we take this commitment to our nation's service very, very seriously. And in fact, my real claim to fame at MSNBC wasn't just that I was the counterterrorism analyst. It was the day that uh, I was brought on to discuss Donald Trump insulting Kazir Khan, uh, the, the father of Humayun Khan, a U.S. Army captain who was killed in Iraq, who saved his seven soldiers from a suicide bomber by making them get behind a barrier. And he, and he went to inspect the car. And in fact, he didn't have to be there. He wasn't even supposed to be there. He was just on a routine inspection. Someone on air in front of me insulted Humayun Khan and Kazir Khan in front of me. And I just exploded on television. Oh my God. So that's where I am right now. Donald Trump is a nobody. He has never done anything for anyone or given any service to the nation. The very fact that you're living overseas, each of you, you're an ambassador of the United States, whether you want to be or not. How, are, how many of you are like me? Two years ago, I was in, um, I was Christmas shopping in Paris and I went into Gallery Lafayette and I was just getting these ornaments wrapped and the woman says, oh, you're American? Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and then, the whole line of people behind me started expressing condolences because I was an American with Donald Trump as president. You're all in this game together. So you also, as ambassadors, are doing a service to the nation. Uh, may, you know, And you represent us in your defense of the people who give you defense, because whether you like it or not, there are times and things that happen especially guys like me in the spy world, we don't tell you that we're looking out for you. We just do it, right? And let me tell you, there have been instances where I was in Europe, uh, the LaBelle disco bombing in 1976 in Berlin, right? We were minutes behind that bomber. Uh, and we actually emptied out every bar in Berlin that U.S. service members were in, knowing there was going to be a bombing. Right? We saved more than the two guys who died live. Right? We saved many. But we don't care. We want you to be safe and we want you to vote. So. Yes, yes. Everyone, please vote. If you're overseas, go to votefromabroad.org and request your absentee ballot. Ask for it to be delivered by email so that it actually arrives since uh, Trump has destroyed our postal service. Um, if you're watching this from the United States, go to IWillVote.com, choose your state, and register your to vote or request or verify that you are registered to vote. Um, wow, I can't believe you've written three books. And I realized a couple of weeks ago, I never read the first one. Um, oh. Yeah, but I read it. I actually, I listened to it on audiobook. I tried to, yeah, I wanted, and that one was pretty startling. Um, could you maybe just give us like a, an overview of what these three books are about? Sure. Well, to be honest, I don't want to brag, but I, I've actually written eight books and the last three are all about Trump. The first one is, is the one that sort of no one believed and it's still selling very well. It's called The Plot to Hack America. I wrote The Plot to Hack America in five weeks and that book actually went to, pub, went to print uh, and was put online on September 20th, 2016, six weeks before the election. And what it was, for those of you who might know what I do at MSNBC, although I'm the terrorism analyst, the counterterrorism and intelligence guy, I had, been, I had written another book the year before called Hacking ISIS. And it was all the disinformation and activities and propaganda ISIS was doing. But one of the things we found was that ISIS, there were two attacks uh, that were attributed to ISIS that were not ISIS, two cyber attacks. One was the Warsaw Stock Exchange, which was where they had burrowed in, stolen all of this information about you know, the Polish uh, stock market, proprietary information. 
and then put up banners on the front like, hey, we're ISIS, we're jihadis, we hate you. The other was TV Sank in Paris, where they did the same thing. They just vacuum cleaned the entire organization. It would turn out that a year later, uh, it, it would be determined amongst the cyber community that that was actually Russian military intelligence pretending to be ISIS. And they were using these malware suites called Advanced Persistent Threat 28 and 29, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear. So the minute I heard the Democratic National Committee had been hacked, my first thought was, wait a minute. The only reason to hack the DNC and go through their servers is to do Watergate. There's no other reason, right? You're stealing information in order to use information. But a couple of weeks later, I'd heard from CrowdStrike, the company that did it, that it was Fancy Bear and Cozy Bear. So this is in April. I was thoroughly convinced that the Russians had hacked in there. And the only reason to do it was to get your preferred candidate to win. And that was not Hillary Clinton. Right. So by July, I was on air. I was the first person in US news media to go on air and say the United States is under attack in an information warfare attack. And no one believed a word I said. For eight, nine weeks, no one believed a word I said. Because everybody was going, ooh, Hillary Clinton emails, you know? So I went home and I wrote the plot to hack America and I laid out everything that was in my head, everything that I could imagine had to occur for the Russians to have done this operation. And uh, it would take two and a half years, but it. If you read it, it's almost identical to the Mueller report, uh, minus the social security numbers of the Russian spies that did it. Uh, but it's a good example, I, I'm, I'm proud to say, of spycraft. It's, it's how your intelligence agencies think. Because on the same day that I delivered my book to my publisher, the Central Intelligence Agency delivered a near identical report to President Obama. But then again, nobody believed Barack Obama. So that's how Plot to Hack America came out. And then uh, actually one of my most important books is The Plot to Destroy Democracy. That's, that pertains to most of you who are in Europe because it's how Vladimir Putin used all these spy craft and ex-KGB tactics to essentially buy every conservative neo-fascist political party in Europe. And that's why you know, Europe is practically under siege by you know, right-wing groups that Steve Bannon goes around and lectures to. This is all a concentrated effort by Russia. And uh, the latest book, The Plot to Betray America, which has just come out last year, uh, I am proud to say I have finally seen that book at Shakespeare and Co. Uh, you know, or <laughs> in Paris. So I made the big time. Uh, and so that book is about how Trump's Nash, his team, all of his, his, his uh, henchmen, Rudy Giuliani, Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort, how they all use their own, you know, uh, use national security for their own purposes and how Trump essentially uh, has betrayed the nation. Turns out all of that is all being proven true now, too. So it's not that I'm Nance Stradamus, as a lot of people here call me. Uh, it's just what you're looking at is Unlike journalists, I have the ability to use experience and pathways of information that are, you know, uh, come from the secret world to say things in advance that are, you know, most of you see with your own eyes. And that's why we're here. You see what I see. We're not crazy. We're normal. It's just that for some people, we have the ability to project in a more logical line based on past experiences. But for those of you who live overseas, you are probably far more attuned to the United States politically, as certainly people in your country are. Um, I, I, I recall that old Daily Show video where, uh, where Rob Riggle goes to Tehran and he's asking people in Iran about what they know about the United States, what name a city in the United States. And uh, he goes out into the countryside, randomly stops a guy who's doing a hay bale. And uh, he says, hey, um, name a city in America. 
And the guy goes, New York. And he goes, oh, everyone knows New York. And he goes, Los Angeles. And he goes, everyone knows Los Angeles. And the old guy sits there and thinks, he goes, Buffalo. <laughs> he goes, how do you know Buffalo, New York? Everyone overseas is more attuned to our politics than we are in the United States. And that's where you have an advantage over your fellow citizen. Yes. Um, yeah, your books are, I read, I, I listened to the first one a couple of weeks ago and I was, I mean, I was shocked that I hadn't, I thought I already had, but it wasn't in my library. So I was like, okay, I have to get this book and read it. And I was totally stunned at like before the election, you called it like totally. Um, and when, yeah. when- I was called a conspiracy theorist for almost three solid years. Yeah, um, a lot of people <laughs> are calling people conspiracy theorists just because they they believe what they see. Um, right. I, I have a question that about basically how can Democrats and other concerned Americans counter um, the GOP's onslaught about uh, dis different disinformation about what's going on with Trump in general and Putin? And, you know, I, I'm really glad you asked that question, because for the last four years, I've been super emphasizing uh, counter disinformation uh, as a national strategy. We don't have one in the United States because the top leadership of the United States needs this foreign disinformation to magnify their own disinformation. Uh, I am also famous at MSNBC for coming on air and being the first person to use the L word against Donald Trump. And I remember the look on poor Chris Matthews' face when I said, let's just face it, this man's a pathological liar. And you could just feel the frisson of tension in the air like, we do not use these words in the media. Well, not a journalist. So, you know, when I see someone is lying, I say they're lying. Um, you know, for those of you who are in Canada, my, 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 my poor late wife um, was from Montreal and her mother and my mother-in-law, who I speak to all the time uh, in Montreal in French, um, she doesn't know how to believe what she sees about Donald Trump. She'll start talking to me like, oh, Trump did this great thing. And I have to do a full slot counter disinformation campaign against my mother-in-law, against my belle-mère. So <laughs> it's really crazy. That is your job. Uh, I've done it uh, uh, just last year, uh, you know, when, after my wife passed, I took my daughter, uh, who was a Sorbonne graduate from the campus in Abu Dhabi. <laughs> and we went to Paris to go see her professors. And she was meeting some of her friends who had lived in Abu Dhabi and then moved to Paris for their graduate program. And they live in an alternate universe. They have data. But when it comes to the United States, somehow the lies tend to override the truth. And she was reading these people the riot act, like, OK, this man's a liar. You have to represent for this country by using the basic tools of, dis, of, of defeating disinformation. And, you know, like this person, Teresa Morelli Ferrari, who just wrote, call it like it is. Yeah. It's a lie. And you have to use the word lie, manteau, right? Whatever yeah. you want to say, you know, that this person is a liar. And then the basic way that you, you reframe the conversation is the man has always lied. He will continue to lie. These lies affect you. Because right now, I'm in upstate New York, I'm rural, so I'm safe. Everywhere else in the United States, I've got a virus that's going to probably end up killing half a Amer million American citizens. And for those of you who endured the lockdowns in Europe and, and uh, in other parts of the world, you got it good. I would take that lockdown. Because right now, 50% of America refuses to believe what they can see with their own lying eyes as representatives overseas of the truth and real democracy. Okay. You got to pull, you got to go over there and you've got to start acting like, you know, 
Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, you know, you have to represent a new nation and explain to them why it's why it's different. Because there's going to be a new world after Donald Trump. We are not returning to where we were. Okay. I mean, we just dumped two trillion dollars of free money. It's an Andrew Yang <laughs> proposal, right? Of yeah, paying except it wasn't minimum wage. It wasn't as nice as Andrew Yang's. It was because it was only one time. Right. You know? Well, that's Republicans for you, right? Yeah. They hate giving you money, but they'll give a trillion dollars to their bestest friends. Yeah. This is the big government lutathon. But again, I think as, as yeah. American citizens, people want to hear what you say. I'm sure they're stopping you all the time. I was over, and Angela, I was just in your area actually earlier this year, and I stopped over at Globe Trekker. <laughs> at Globetrotter, the, the camping store in Frankfurt. And people wanted to hear, I'm, you're an American. What's going on over there? What do you think of this crazy guy? Are the covers of Der Spiegel correct? Yes, they are. So <laughs> represent in your, in your individual nation the best of what America is. And you got to start it off by saying, President of the United States is a bold-faced pathological liar. Well, the truth is what it is. Yeah, okay. well, that's, um, that's an, I mean, that's so interesting, too, because, you know, it really seems obvious that Trump uh, models himself after Richard Nixon. And there's so many aspects of his behavior, including his uh, desire to speak to Bob Woodward and be recorded by Bob Woodward. Mm -hmm. That seems to kind of uh, uh, mirror that. Well, what, what is your thinking about why is he why is he looking so much towards Nixon? And, and what is he hoping to get out of that relation that 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 modeling? I have to tell you, I think Trump's Trump's uh, parallels to Nixon stop at the paranoia, and you know, and this in the, this inherent belief that other people are doing machinations behind him. Nixon at least maintained the dignity of the office, right? Trump has been through a hundred times more activities than you know negative activities than Nixon. Donald Trump will blow Nixon off the charts for, for in terms of actual corruption because Trump is guaranteed. He didn't walk, shuffle off the stage and, and have the, you know, the, uh, the umbrage of feeling that it was going to catch up to him and perhaps he should just become a private citizen and take this away. Donald Trump is here to burn this down. He will rule this nation as a dictator. And I saw somebody a little earlier was in, was in Romania. So you know how it feels. And he he literally is only thing keeping him out of jail is this election. OK, there is going to be accountability. Trust me, I am on the Biden team um, and there will be accountability. I had very early on many people saying Kamala Harris should be attorney general because she was attorney general of California. I said, no, Kamala Harris should be vice president but appoint her to find the attorney general. And that, and that, when she's doing that hunt, there should be one question. When we set you loose, will you make sure that all crimes over the last four years are, are investigated and accounted for? And then if anybody who says yes, you're on the short list because we've just gone through four years of pure lawlessness, lawlessness. Yes. And and and, the, and I've been I've I've been caught up in in some of their ridiculousness. Donald Trump's behavior has allowed his tribe, this white male, uneducated, generally rural tribe, uh, with guns, to start emulating him to the point of murder. I've had over fifty death threats. I live in this this house in upstate New York. I had fifty death threats in one week because of Breitbart had wrote an article that I was a member of ISIS. Do they know what the word counter in counterterrorism means? You know, but they're such, they're, they're so, they're so cult-like in their belief system. Um, funny thing is when I wrote this new book, Plot to Betray America, I went to Germany, I went to Berlin and then I went to Dresden to go hang out in Putin's office when he was a baby spy. And it was fascinating. I met with some of the great 
you know, Stasi and KGB scholars over there. Putin loved the Stasi. He loved how the East Germans ran the country like the Nazis and did it with an iron fist. So when he left, when the Soviet Union collapsed, his model for Russia is not the former Soviet Union. It is East Germany. And so you get a feel for how authoritarians behave. And seeing that space and understanding that this was a guy whose sole job was to manipulate people, you could also see why Trump would be such an easy mark for him. Oh. <laughs> oh my God! Yes, he, you know, uh, in your book you mentioned that uh, the qualities that they look for in a unwitting, you know, um, asset. A asset. And man, he fits every criteria. He's so egotistical and narcissistic. You know, like if somebody's doing something for him, he doesn't care if it's huh? illegal or not, or moral, or um, if he's the commander in chief of our military, you can't behave like he does. Like, it's very shocking. Um, we have a, a follow-up for that question about, sure. about Russia. It's, it's uh, from one of our members who happens to actually be in Russia. Um, oh, yeah. What do you think about the theory that if Trump loses the election by a landslide, he'll resign and Pence will pardon him so he never has to face conviction? Never happened. His ego will not allow that to occur. I know people who know Donald Trump. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be having lunch with one very soon whose last name ends in Mucci. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and I know other people who have done business with him uh, in Hollywood and things like that. And they all say to a man, if you ever watch anyone on MSNBC, the guy to watch for really accurate, the most accurate Trump advice is Donnie Deutsch, who knew Donald Trump right up until the inauguration. And at that minute, their relationship ended. Donnie Deutsch knows this man, and he gives insights that are spy-level activity. But when he says Trump will not, he says, you're going to have a hard time getting him out of the building. That's when you go, OK, that's a little crazy. Um, but no, Trump won't resign unless, you know, I mean, look, these guys are going to burn all the documents. They don't care about laws. They don't care about retaining things. But, you know, if, if they lose, and of course, all of us are going to ensure that they lose, especially those of you who live in Florida, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, da, da, da. Every vote counts. Every vote um, counts. Every dang one of them. Um, so... Get, they will not leave office happily. Let me put it that way. Um, and, you know, maybe he has to go kicking and screaming. Uh, my, my peer on MSNBC, Clint Watts, who is an FBI counterterrorism officer, said what I think is the most prophetic thing. He said November 4th, the day after the election until January 20th, 2021, will be the single most dangerous period in American history. Mm hmm. Yes. Yes. Yes, it will. It's very scary. Um, just so everybody in the audience knows, if you'd like to ask a question, please enter it into the Q&A box, although some of you have already done so. So thank you. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you can just write your questions in the chat. I'm sorry, in the comments. Um, we, and we do have one uh, question that's a follow up to what we've just been talking about. It's from sure. Anne Hesse, who's in Germany. She's our uh, global uh, chair of our Women's Caucus. And she says, we have so little time left before the election. Is there anything that our dim leaders can do first to stop Putin's attack on our election? And also, how can we? what can we do if Trump refuses to accept defeat? Okay, well, first, the, the only way to defeat any shenanigans, to use a, a, <laughs> an amusing word, um, in this campaign is simply blow out the margins. This must be such a decisive victory that even if they cheat, uh, they, there's, there's just no way around it. I've warned, and, and this is where I put on my I'm going to make you afraid hat because I am a professional at spelling out the bad things that can happen and the pathways out of them. 
um, people are always looking at Russia, Russia, Russia. Well, in this particular election, if I was going to really predict someone that would need to help Donald Trump, I would say North Korea would do an incredibly obvious sloppy hack of a critical state. And this time they wouldn't give Donald Trump, they wouldn't give Donald Trump 10 or 20 million votes. They'd give the Democrats 20 million fake votes, right? Like say one county in Wisconsin uh, that has 20,000 people in it suddenly has 3 million votes for, for Joe Biden. That is the baking of civil war right there. Because Donald Trump, aided by his buddies in North Korea who have real capability, can say, this entire election's a sham. I'm neutralized, nullifying this. Constitution doesn't have anything in it that says that this election can, has to, can be nullified. The election will go forward. There will be an inauguration on January 20th. Donald Trump can make a machination. Whoop, sorry. There you go. Donald Trump can, can use these machinations to essentially say, I'm president, and that's just the way it's going to be. And he'll have an attorney general behind him who'll go with it. And he thinks he'll be able to engineer the Electoral College in the Supreme Court. Now, it may end up Nancy Pelosi as president on January 20th if it's not resolved, because that's what the Constitution says. She's third in line. Wow. Um, yeah, OK, you are making me a little scared, but that's OK. I was already scared <laughs> my, anyway. I know, and the good news is well. there's hundreds of, of, of local election offices in Wisconsin, so it'd be really hard to send a million votes to Wisconsin. It, it, yeah. Well, you know That's the good I mean. thing about our really our, our very diverse uh, election system. It's incredibly hard to hack because of that. The one thing here's where everybody should be a little more afraid. The one thing that is not hard to hack, because you're right, voting machines in each precinct are different. They're not all electric, uh, electronic. Some are mechanical. Other are paper ballots. Where it's all electronic in one computer is the tally at the state secretary of state's office. That computer that puts together, remember in the old days, Julie, you probably remember this like me, they used to do it on a chalkboard in states and do the math right there as reporting came in. Well, they don't do that anymore. There's a laptop with an Excel worksheet <laughs> that does all of that, does this and that's hackable. Wow, wow. Um... We have a question that was sent in uh, from a member, David Minua Nabati. He's in uh, Beirut, Lebanon. And his question is, what specific actions can we push, our, push the US, our candidates, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, especially in the Democratic Party to do in the upcoming four years to improve representative democracy in the world and specifically in the Middle East? Oh, just first off, you know, I want to say hello to all my my friends out there in Lebanon, Shlurik, Kevalik, you know, Hupakawi. Uh, but um, uh, it's a really good question. And I hope you and your family are well after that terrible accident in Beirut. Uh, I haven't been in Beirut since 1984 when I had my own bombing down at the airport. So good question. What's go what can you do? What can Joe Biden and all them do? Exist. And form a government because what's happening right now, we have four years of the dismantling of democracy around the world. Almost 70 years of work has been personally undermined by Donald Trump. I mean, you know, people say, well, is the guy the Manchurian candidate? No, he's not the Manchurian candidate. The Manchurian candidate was manufactured through a psychological, you know, conditioning. Donald Trump himself has a Manchurian candidate mindset. He's going to go in, but he's working for someone else. And that someone else, Vladimir Putin, he personally said, what I loved about Vladimir Putin is last year, he came out and gave a speech where he decided, it, it was almost like he said, Malcolm, no one believes your books, so I'm going to give a speech validating every point you made in them. And my favorite point by Putin is when he said, liberal democracy around the world needs to be dismantled. It is a failed ideology. 
And I said, go, oh, that's great. I wrote three books about how you said that, you know, how you were acting in that way. Trump is an asset of that ideology, the dismantling of democracy, because democracy gets in the way of oligarchy. And oligarchy is essentially untold billions and trillions of dollars that have no flag and no loyalty to anyone but money. These are the guys, Trump, you know, Trump is, the reason that he became president is he wants to be an oligarch. He's not, he's too poor. He wants to have a giant mega yacht that has an elevator for smaller yachts, okay? But he can't afford it. And being president of the United States does not give you access to the oligarch world, you know? So, you know, as a, as a former U.S. intelligence officer, tracking crazy oligarch money going to terrorist groups was a full-time job. Now I've got an entire nation and I've got people who are above flags, literally believing that dismantling democracy by every conservative political group in Europe, fund them to the max and then have a vote and let, this is the best part about their plan, use democracy to mm -hmm. vote out democracy. Yes, yes, that is, that is their plan, 100%. And so far it's working, unless we do something. So I would advise everyone to vote, go to votefromabroad.org or iwillvote.com, register to vote, request your absentee ballot. Don't delay, time is running out. And get um, three of your friends to do the same thing too. Yes, Yeah. 100%. Have, have a vote party. Get yep. together, fill out those ballots. That is true. Buy them pizza. <laughs> Buy them pizza. Or, so or whatever it takes to get or them canola, to vote. That's true. Yeah, <laughs> whatever it sure. takes. Or pizza is not Even, good enough. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah, a steak doesn't matter. Um, yep. I have a question from a member from Greece. Um, how precarious has the Trump approach made the situation in the Eastern Aegean? Oh. <laughs> good ass question. Let me tell you something. First off, uh, for those of you who are in Spain, I lived in Rota, Spain for eight years. And that's where I deployed all over the Mediterranean. I have been everywhere in the Aegean Sea, you know, even some of the more obscure islands. Well, here's your problem with Greece. It's twofold. One, while you're looking at the Eastern Aegean situation, but that means the, the, the territorial waters between Turkey and Greece, and where Turkey put hundreds of thousands of refugees into the water to go into Central Europe and destabilize it so that Erdogan could actually, uh, you know, essentially turn his country into a dictatorship. At the same time, the Russians were backing Greek right-wing conservative groups over there who also were destabilizing your country and your economy, right? Fascist groups. Now, I want you to think about that word. Greece literally had to fight itself free of Nazis <laughs> in World War II, right? And the same fascist groups, the same ideology that were backing the Nazis, okay, are now come, were, came to prominence in Greece and Italy and Hungary and actually run the government of Austria and AFD in Germany and Nation Front National in France. And, you know, tried to get Catalonia to separate from Spain. This stuff is not happening in a bubble. It's happening to all of you collectively because there is oil and oligarch money buying people, right? Like Gerhard Schroeder, the former chancellor of Germany. There's a German phrase that they use for former political leaders who have been bought by Russia. It's called Schroederization. Pretty soon it's going to be called Trumpification because they are buying people. And the funny thing is, it's happening in public. I mean, look, at it's, I'm going to give you a quick little aside. You think it's only happening to politicians? I'm going to name two other people that it's happened to. Gerard Depardieu. The, the famous French actor is living in Russia, has a Russian passport, loves Putin, 
And all he acts is as a spokesman for Moscow while he's sitting around getting drunk and chasing 18-year-old women. And the other is Steven Seagal, what? the actor. He's a Russian citizen now. He, oh, how are you guys not knowing this? He's a Russian citizen, uh, emigrated from the United States, best friend of Vladimir Putin, goes over there and, you know, pretends like he's teaching karate to the Spetsnaz. All of these people are being bought, right? Donald Trump, those are the, the actors, right? Donald Trump, oh, by the way, David Duke, the head of the Ku Klux Klan in the United States, has an apartment in Moscow. Who does he share that apartment with? Richard Spencer, the head of the neo-Nazis in the United States. Because, uh, what's this, Depper Doe was a communist? Wow, that's crazy. Uh, but Richard Spencer, the head of the neo-Nazis in the United States, who is married to a pro-Moscow Ukrainian, who is the official translator of Alexander Dugin, Putin's philosopher. These people are incestuous. And they all live, they all have this thing where Moscow is the center of the white Christian universe for them. And that's why democracy, American democracy, as it's existed from my birth town, Philadelphia, since 1776, no longer works for them. They want a dictatorship, or as I call it, a constitutional autocracy in which the Constitution applies only to the 30% that voted for Trump, and the rest of you get screwed by the autocrat. Wow, that is um, horrifying, um, yes. especially <laughs> the fact that people are so, so, you know, I thought Steven Seagal was rich. Why would he need to be bought off? I, it's just, it just seems weird. The same reason that ISIS did their operation. You know, I've written several books about the juxtaposition between extremist groups around the world. Women and money. You know, I don't know why, but they all think that, uh, you know, Russia is a one continuous Miss Universe pageant. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's it, not, but I... <laughs> in the heads of these men. Yeah, that is true. Um, I have a question um, from Angela Parker. She says, how the Trump administration is removing Trumps from Germany. How does this help Russia? Oh, well, one, it destabilizes the NATO alliance. Two, what's, here's where it really hurts us. Um, these forces in Germany are not forward deployed combat forces. They're the people that ship food to Iraq and Syria. They are like, like um, re, uh, what uh, the air base that we have there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Remstein Air Remstein. Base and, you know, the military hospital, right? Landstuhl, which have been there since World War II. Mm -hmm. That is our principal evacuation point for anything that happens in the entire Eastern Hemisphere. If you're wounded, all right, you are sent to land stool to be stabilized, then flown back to the United States. Stabilization could take months, all right? For some strange reason, Donald Trump now believes that whatever Moscow wants, Moscow should have. By removing U.S. troops from Germany, it destabilizes the alliance at, that we've had since the end of World War II uh, because he hates women. And Germany's run by a woman. Mm -hmm. And let me give you another point of fact about Germany, because I was there just before coronavirus. Um, Germans are actually better Americans than we are right now. <laughs> They're the ones going, hey, what's wrong with you guys? What's up yeah. with your, don't you remember democracy? Don't you remember how you fought to get rid of fascism? Why are your people becoming fascist lovers? When I got to go to Germany to get a lecture about that, the world is topsy-turvy. Yeah, that's, um, it's always amazing to me when I see all these Americans who are like neo-Nazis and um, fast, you know, they're Confederates. And it's really, it's really disgusting to me. Like we, my grandfather fought in World War II to rid the world of Nazism, yes. not so that so that all these people can just be like, "Ooh, I'm a Nazi." You know, we were the good guys in that war. So come on, Americans, shape it up, really. And Do Donald Trump does not believe in the outcomes of that war. 
that our job was to help foster democracies and freedom of, 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 how can I put it? Freedom to participate in government by nations and expand. He is a fascist. Let's just use the term. What did Mussolini define a fascist as? A dictatorship of the corporate right. The guy who created fascism came up with that term. So Donald Trump is a right-wing corporatist. And so anything that gets in the way of that money, he is against. And what has been in the way of that money has been American democracy. You have to understand something also um, for for all of you. Americans, I'm I'm, going to go on a limb and say it. Not you who are overseas. You're obviously much smarter than usual. Americans are not that smart anymore Mm. since the greatest generation has started to die. They knew what the stakes were to save the world. That's my mom, my dad, who served, who joined the Navy at 15 in 1944. And when the wars ended, they realized that keeping the world stable was good and they didn't have to go fight any more wars. The people who are in now are essentially their children who are, you know, these now in their 60s and 70s who don't believe in those values anymore their value now is money and their money is comes from with their belief that one tribe should rule america and that is the white male uncollege educated rural tribe um quick aside i did the global security program for the peace corps about 15 years ago created this whole organization and uh I had to go to Papua New Guinea and I learned tribalism firsthand. Every village in New Guinea is terrified of the next village. So every person in that country who is not from that little cluster of houses is terrified of every other person. That is what Donald Trump is trying to do in America. He is trying to tribalize the country. Um, I actually had somebody, I swear to God, this is not a joke. I said, The motto of the United States is e pluribus unum, from many, one. And some wiseacre right wing crazy said, where do you think, where did you get that? I said, it's the top 12 letters around the top of the Capitol building, e pluribus unum, right under the statue of Columbia. And I mean, these people are so ignorant They no longer care that that is the official motto of the United States. Just, that is amazing. And, you know, a recent study just came out saying about how, um, uh, you know, basic facts and basic information is kind of, is low and limited in the United States. And I, I, you really see this playing out. But going back to the military, you know, we're, that's really cool that you're in Rota. We were just in Rota doing a lot of um, voter outreach um, with all the naval uh, uh, folk there. And you know, one of the things that comes up as a question for lots of people are, if if Trump does uh, lose the election and stages a push, um, what support do you think he would have from the military? Here's the way the system works. Uh, I answer this question weekly. The armed forces of the United States uh, will carry out any orders that are one lawful. Okay, we have a personal individual obligation to resist and and refuse to follow unlawful orders. So for example, if Donald Trump after the election says, I'm mobilizing all of the army units in the United States to guard against Antifa takeover of US cities, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff will say, I'm sorry, in consultation with the other chair Joint Chiefs, that is an unlawful order. There is no intelligence supporting that. You can give that order. Since the May Lai massacre in 1970, you know, in in Vietnam, the rule is you have, you must disobey an unlawful order. The armed forces isn't doing nothing. There aren't gonna be any coups. There aren't gonna be any push. And if he decides that this is freaking, you know, that he thinks that he's in Munich, 1935, and he's gonna take his brown shirts and go around and start, I don't know if that's 35, somebody check my numbers, but it's around there. 
he's going to take his brown shirts or take his black shirts and and go out and start using federal law enforcement agents like they tried in Seattle. You know, those cops were on Customs and Border Patrol, and they were the Federal Protective Service. Those are the guys who are running x-ray machines at embassies and consulates and things like that. No, this is not going to happen because, one, the system's not designed for it to happen. Two, you know, you know, Vladimir Putin actually gave a speech where he warned Donald Trump in public to be on guard for what he called an American Maidan. Maidan was the revolution in the Ukraine, which pushed out the pro-Moscow government through pure people power, hitting the streets. Putin is terrified of people power. He hates it. That's why he just poisoned Navalny, right? People, I'm telling you, 100 million Americans will hit the street the next day. And I wouldn't be surprised if we just had to occupy buildings. But I don't know if anybody's been to D.C. recently. There is a giant white concrete wall all around the White House now. I mean, that guy, he's got paranoia going. I mean, meth head level paranoia going on in Donald Trump's White House. But the military is not going to get involved. We'll just stop following orders. We're like, okay, I'm just going to fix my tank. <laughs> that would be, I, I hope that's the case. Um, we have a question from Christina in Norway. She asked, can you address the, the threat to NATO if Trump wins? Interesting question from a Norwegian who aren't in NATO. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I spent some time in Norway um, uh, a, a year or so ago, actually. Um, and it, it's, it's, it's fascinating. First place in the world that I had a, a Norwegian recognize me as being a person who was on Bill Maher's show. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's weird. Um, so... The threat to NATO is very severe. Uh, Donald Trump had a meeting with the prime minister of Sweden. And because he is ignorant of everything, he thought that Sweden was a member state of NATO, which it is not. Sweden participates in NATO activities for its own defense, but it is not a member of NATO. So the prime minister had to explain this to him, you know, Barney style that Sweden is a separate country, even though it's Scandinavian, it is not a member state of NATO. It just participates with NATO when it wants to. Donald Trump, this was two years ago, Donald Trump said, that's what I want for the United States. It was the first time that he indicated that he wanted to withdraw from NATO. I suspect we will be out of NATO next January if Trump withdraws. Donald Trump, I, I don't know how to explain this, but whatever happened between him and Putin, Trump just doesn't follow orders. Trump embodies the philosophy of the people that he thinks will reward him for what he's doing. Oh my gosh, you know, there can't be any NATO without us. We created NATO. Yeah, like there's no NATO without us. I, I, like having, I think some people don't know that. It's like having Oprah magazine. And they're like, <laughs> well, Oprah's not in Oprah Mag Oprah doesn't do Oprah magazine anymore. Now it's called Vanity Fair. I mean, it ain't the same thing, right? We it won't be NATO. Uh, I, there will be a rebellion in the armed forces at that point. Just mass resignations. No one will want to serve. Yeah. Um, all right. We have tons of questions. Uh, everybody loves you, Malcolm. Give me some rapid fire. Uh, okay, all right, rapid fire. Ooh, not all these are so deep. Uh, what do you say to Trump supporters in order to penetrate the adoration? <laughs> uh. <laughs> Is that rapid? <laughs> no. no. Last Friday on Joy Reid, I'm going to give you a play out of what I said on Joy Reid last Friday. And I said, I said, uh, you know, I was a Navy chief. Uh, we are the middle management in the military. We are respected because we usually have 10, 20 years of experience. And, you know, we are the common sense level between officers and enlisted. And I said, I'm going to ask the, a question that needs to be asked of Donald Trump. 
uh, by someone. Someone needs to go up and ask, what is wrong with you? <laughs> right? I mean, this is the only way to get Trump voters. I found that this this it's a, this counter ideology tactic is what you we had to use on ISIS members. The only way to deprogram them was to introduce what we call the weapon of doubt. And you would juxtapose whatever horrible thing with them personally. Right? And so for example, you would say, "Oh, you're a Trump voter. I I'm sorry, you know. So why do you like to cage children?" And they were like, oh, I don't care. So, no, you support that, right? You support putting babies in prisons at the border and letting them bake. No, no, that was Obama. No, it wasn't. By the way, I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. You've got to hit them directly. Why do you hate women? Right? And they'll say that they don't. Well, Donald Trump hates women. You hate women. Why do you hate black people? I don't hate black people. I work with black people. No, you're a racist. People say, oh, you can't use racist. You have my permission to use the word racist in my name as much as you want. Because these people, it's, you know, there was a great book called Hitler's Willing Executioners that talked about why the butcher and the baker from tiny villages in Germany came to be enthralled and in love deeply with Adolf Hitler to the point where they would go out to the Russian front and execute people with guns or be guards at Auschwitz-Birkenau, you know? They, what's happening with the Trump people is this form of cultism. He embodies their belief. You know, they always say, well, political correctness. We don't like political correctness. That's saying, I don't want to be allowed to be decent. I want to be allowed to call someone the N word when I want, or the S word when I want, you know, or the W word, for those of you who live in Italy, when I want, right? I have the right to be an anti-Semite. I have a right to hate Muslims. No, you don't. You got a right to get your, your butt kicked. If you do that in America, but let me tell you, I run into one of those guys in Europe, there will be a serious recalibration. First thing I would ask is, why the hell are you in Europe? Right? Moscow's that way. Move. Okay, you want a racist state? I'm sorry for those of you who live in Austria, but, you know, you want to go out there? Go, you know, go somewhere else. But you're not an American. You cannot represent a country that was represented by Thomas Jefferson in Paris. And here's why I say that. I mean, come on. He, he, was, he was essentially there having children with his wife's half-sister who was black. That's pretty liberal for 1778. So just pointing this out to you, okay? Some historic facts never hurt. That's right. Do you have time America? for one more fast question? Okay, sure. Um, this more. is from Adrian Johnson. She's in the UK and she says, what oh, is the no, danger no. of the divide and conquer ideology behind Trump's law and order narrative? Well, the danger is, is that it will mobilize his base. It has no other benefit. He wants, he stokes violence so that violence gets on television screen. Um, in fact, he actually started his initial campaign in 2015 and 2016 pushing law and order. And it didn't stick. It, what stuck was Hillary's emails. And so he went with that. But don't forget, in 2018, it was caravans are coming from Latin America and MS-13 are coming. This is his trick. I think Americans are sick of it. And, um, you know, uh, one last thing I want to I mention before I, I finish out here. If you guys have Ma's and Pa's out there who are Trump voters, okay, and you want to try to give that little bit of dignified deprogramming, just say, would you vote? You know, I, I always kick off with a racist. You, you vote for everything that man stands for, which means you stand against America. Why do you hate America so much? And they'll say, I love America, freedom, you know? No, it's not freedom. You're a tribalist and you want the white tribe to dominate and you want this fat draft dodger who 
he's got five children with three baby mamas. Use that phrase on. They, they hate hearing that, you know? Everything that they accuse minorities of being, Donald Trump has been. He steals from you. He gives his children jobs. Why do you support this man? Vote this election. You're going to vote for America or you're going to vote for Trump. There is no in between. Wow. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. As always, uh, you are incredibly enlightening, and I think many of us could listen to you for hours, um, <laughs> for sure, uh, definitely. I have one last question that that just, it's a, it's a quick one. Um, okay. I think her name was uh, Christina in the audience. She asked, if uh, Biden asked you to be the DNI, would you do it? <laughs> 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 director of National Intelligence, here's the kicker. To be director of national intelligence, you had to have had a career position or a career in intelligence or a background in intelligence. I have been more qualified than the last two directors of national intelligence. Well, you're I'm definitely more qualified than the one now. So I'm 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 not yeah, definitely better than Ratcliffe. And for you guys who had to put up with Grinnell in Germany, what an embarrassment. What a moron. Um you should have just stripped him of his credentials. Uh, no, I'm not qualified to be the director of national intelligence. But there is this counterterrorism ambassadorship that staged out of Paris that could take. <laughs> See you all on Rue de Rivoli, right? We'll be hanging out at Place Vendome. You can come up and say hi. <laughs> you have all your books at Shakespeare and Co. That would be perfect. That will be good. We'll have a book signing. That would be <laughs> awesome. Uh, Thank you so much, Malcolm, for joining us today. Thank you to the audience for joining us. Everyone, request your ballot if you haven't done mm -hmm. it already. Uh, make sure your relatives and friends and acquaintances are um, got to have their ballots and are registered to vote. Um, tell all your friends. Tell people you don't even know. You know, right. we're we're at the point of just walking up to people on the street saying, "Are you American?" Um, yeah because it's really important that we blow this election out. Yeah. Yeah. We gotta blow it out because we can't have four more years of Trump. There'll yeah. be no more United States. There'll right. be no more freedom. It'll yeah. always be- Will you tell us to go to IWillVote.com? We would love to hear you say that for, for, for everybody. Sure. Um, oh, you want me to say that? Yes, we want you Everyone to Everyone go, go to IWillVote.com. I have one last comment to make. This is on a sad note. One year ago tomorrow, my wife passed away from cancer. She was a very funny person. She was raised in Montreal, but she was born in West Lafayette, Indiana for six months. So she was an American citizen, even though she had this huge, funny French Canadian accent, right? Um, I, I will feel personally destroyed if the country that I fought for and the nation that I helped build and uh, and which I met my wife and we worked together. I actually got her to work with me in Iraq, right? She's a landscape architect, anti-suicide bunkers. That's all I wanna say about that. I will be horribly crushed if we lose an American democracy ends and I have to go forward with the rest of my life fighting these monsters because some of you, just didn't feel obligated to fill out that ballot. Fill it out. You owe it to me. You owe it to my family and my entire family military history to help save this nation. Do your part now. I've done ours. I've already voted, by the way. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you, Malcolm. And uh, you know, I think a lot of the people on this call are not only voting, but they're getting hundreds of people to vote. And I think yeah. I really appreciate everyone who is working that hard. We are, there's. There's, there's volunteers all over the world who are feeling the same way that you're feeling. And we just really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you so much. Well, I love you. And if you guys need Martin Sheen for another call, I can arrange that. Well, that would be cool. That would be nice. <laughs> He's my yes. buddy. Wow, we love all uh, of thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Malcolm. Okay. I don't bye know bye. if you're as cool as you are, but that would be fun too. Thank you so much. Right. Right. Thanks. Bye, bye bye. Thanks everybody for joining us today. And uh, remember to donate to at democratsabroad.org slash donate. We can't do any of this without money. And uh, we are churning and burning, trying to advertise, and we need all the revenue we can get. So donate.
Democrats abroad. There you go. There's the, the links in the chat box. Thank you, Angela. All right. Good always night, great everybody. to see you, everybody. Ciao. Bye. Bye.